Okay, so this is um, the traditional Buddhist chanting class. This is the first Tuesday in October. It's October already. This is October 3rd, and we're going to be talking tonight about the uh, Extend Life 10 Phrase Kanon Sutra, also known as Kanzeon Chanting. Um, and uh, so before we do anything else, we'll do some Kanzeon Chanting. Uh, oh yeah, let's see. So I'll share, I'll share my screen now. It does appear to be recording. I'm going to mute everybody. Juku Kanang Yo Kanze Om Namu Butu Yoga Tu in Yoga Tu in Bupo So in Joda Kruga Jo Jon in Kanze Om Bom in Kanze Om in Men Tu Shinki Men Men Furi Shin Kanze Om Namu Butu Yoga Tu in Yoga Tu see anybody. Can people see me? No. You can't you can't see me? No. I can see you. <laughs> okay. No. So I can see a oh, okay. there you are. Yeah, okay. All right. So hopefully my uh computer won't crash. Um I I've it, it's crashed a couple times over the last week and a half. And I ran, I ran diagnostics on it, um, and it said everything's fine except for the hard drive and the memory. Um, so that's not good. <laughs> uh, we'll see. Hopefully, we make it through the, the class without the computer crashing. So um, before um, diving in, uh, does anybody have any uh, questions or um, anything you want to talk about, bring up concerning the Kanzeon chant or anything else? 
All right. Well, and so I should say the, this this class was especially challenging, at least for me, because we're focusing on well, focusing on the one line Joe Rakugajo uh, in the chant, uh, which is you know, we've already talked about spirit possession, right? We've already we've already talked about Hakuin and and talked about hell, uh, but then when you get to the line Joe Rakugajo, then things get weird. Um, or deep or something like that. Anyway, let me um, uh, share my screen again. And this is actually the last slide, but I want to start here for reasons. And just I just want to emphasize something. I don't want to overemphasize this, but it is important to know, whoops, did, uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, I can no longer see my screen. Okay, here we go. There we go. Oh boy, this is probably going to be a fun, fun presentation. Anyway, one of the things I want to emphasize and that I have emphasized in the past is that this is not a Japanese chant and it's not in Japanese. It doesn't come from Japanese Buddhism. It's a Chinese chant. Um, and so this is a, uh, Oh yeah, my uh, no longer in slideshow mode. Let's try that again. Yeah. Okay. So I like the slideshow mode because then I have a laser pointer. Um, but that this is uh, this is from a Japanese uh, Buddhist website. Actually, from a, a Facebook group run by a Japanese Buddhist group called the Global Buddhism. This is their. Um, <clears throat> if you click on this link, if you're if you're logged into Facebook and you click on this link, it will change your default language to Japanese, and so every because <laughs> it thinks, oh, you're tap anyway. So this is a uh, this is the Kanzayon Sutra. The actually here it is. And this is spelled out in. Um, Hiragana, en mei ju ku kan on gyo. Um, that's Japanese. Um, this is not. Uh, so Japanese, when they're writing Japanese, use a lot of uh, kanji, Chinese characters. But when you see something that's all kanji, like this is, then it's not Japanese. It's, it's Chinese. So this is this is the way. Well, this this may not be a typical Japanese chanting book, but when they want to show people the Kanzayon Sutra, uh, this is what they uh, uh, show you. Um, and this is this is it. Enmei Juku Kanon Gyo Kanzayon Namu Butsu Yo Butsu Uen Yo Butsu Uen Bupo So En Jo Raku Ga Jo Chonen Kanzayon Bonen Kanzayon Nen Nen Ju Shin Ki Nen nen fu li shen. Um, just to a lot of the, the the last class was was on the Chinese origins uh, of the uh, uh, Kanzayon chant, and just to drive that point a little further home, I want to show that, and I added it as the last slide because I didn't want to renumber all the slides. <laughs> Instead of making it the first, because I just discovered that kind of at the last moment. Anyway, so <clears throat> this is the whole chant, and this is uh, highlighting the part of the chant that we're going to do tonight. Um, so I know I've had, there's been a couple of little uh, technical glitches. Is everybody still okay? People can see the screen and hear me. And okay, good. Thank you. I need reassurance. <laughs> All right, um, and the more or less a pretty good English translation of this line. I, this is one of the easier lines to translate into English, and it's by far the most difficult line to actually talk about and explain. Eternity, bliss, self, purity. That's what we chant when we chant Jo Raku Gajo. Eternity, bliss, self, purity. All right. So now, what's this all about? Well, um, so the first uh, five lines of the chant 
Kanteon, Namu Butu, Yobutu Uen, Yobutu Uen, Bupo Soen, um, can be roughly uh, <sighs> summarized as, as taking refuge and 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 uh, generating or, or generating is is a term that's often used bodhicitta. Okay. Um, now, uh, I rely on the authority of Hakuin when I uh, say that this chant definitely involves um, the uh, aspiration, application, and absolute bodhicitta. I'll talk about these. Um, so th this part of the chant, more as as we talked about in the last class, is about causes and conditions. Okay, but causes and conditions are things that we uh these are causes and conditions that we can do something about <laughs> which means they're really more like conditions um, because the ultimate cause is buddha nature which we can't do anything about bodhicitta is is the kind of the the, the aspect of buddha nature that we can do something about because bodhicitta can be you can have it or not have it. If you have it, you can increase it. If you have it, you can also lose it. And if you lose it, you can get it back again. And those are all things that are not true of Buddha nature. Um, and so, and so the problem with Buddha nature is that people sometimes uh, just latch onto the idea of Buddha nature and they say, I don't have to do anything. <laughs> I already have Buddha nature or possibly I'm already a Buddha. Um, but anyway, so the, uh, uh, anyway, so this is the causes and conditions. The first five lines, line number six is the result, which is Buddhahood or Nirvana. Um, jo Raku Gajo. And as, um, oh, then this is a little lightning strike. And I'm going to, I'll talk more about lightning in a little bit. This is a little lightning strike. And this is uh, Buddha, uh, the character for Buddha in the, in the little, Batman Kapow um, <laughs> cartoon. So, Jo Raku Ga Jo. These characters are actually pretty straightforward to translate. Um, eternal, unchanging, permanent, Jo. Raku, joy, happiness, bliss. Ga, self, I, me. And this is a, if you, if you take a 101 Chinese Mandarin class, this is one of the first learn words you'll learn is is how to refer to is the first person pronoun I, me, myself, uh, Joe. Joe will not necessarily be one of the first words you learn, but this is a, a word in the Heart Sutra, <laughs> which which we'll refer to in, in in just a minute. But this is from the handy dandy um, digital dictionary of Buddhism over here. Um, so if you know. And which I didn't know until quite recently that these are called the four virtues, and and that's short for the four virtues of Nirvana. Um, if you look up four virtues <clears throat> on the Digital Dictionary of Buddhism, uh, and that's what these two characters mean. This is the character for four, and this is one of the characters that can be translated into English as as virtue or merit. Um, or positive attributes. So this is this is what the four virtues are: the four positive attributes of Buddhist religious experience that are taught as an antidote to the negativity of teachings such as that of emptiness. Now this is kind of a heavy-handed way of putting it, um, uh, in my opinion, uh, but it's it's to the point. Um, one of the best known sources for this notion is the Nirvana Sutra. The Nirvana Sutra in this case is, is referring specifically to the Mahayana Maha Parinirvana Sutra. Uh, there is a Pali uh, uh, Sutta in the um, uh, Theravada tradition, um, which is also called the Nirvana Sutra. In both cases, those, those suttas or sutras refer to the very last teachings uh, of the Buddha before his final nirvana um <clears throat> anyway and in the in the mahayana maha the mahayana maha pari nirvana sutra it refers to the four attributes or four virtues of uh, nirvana as jo raku ga jo um 
course, the Buddha didn't speak Japanese, but if he did, uh, that's how he would have pronounced those Chinese characters. He didn't speak Chinese either, but, you know, okay. Now, so if you go around looking for explanations, now, now one thing that the Digital Dictionary of Buddhism is suggesting is, oh, well, we'll just go read the Nirvana Sutra and um, then we'll understand what this is talking about. Uh, anyone here ever read the Mahayana Mahapari Nirvana Sutra? Man, it's, uh, you know, yeah, it's a head scratcher. Um, it's a good one, uh, but it's, um, yeah, it's not an easy read. Oh, let me see, what am I doing here? Oh, yeah, okay. So, in, uh, now, this is from a commentary on the Lotus Sutra by good old uh, venerable, venerable master Swan Hua, who was the founding teacher of the city of 10,000 Buddhas out in California. Um, and uh, in his commentary on the um, Lotus Sutra, not the Nirvana Sutra, the Lotus Sutra, he refers to this, this very interesting event at the very, very, very beginning of the Lotus Sutra, where rays of light uh, shine out uh, from the tuft of hair. This is one of the 32 marks of a Buddha, is this white tuft of hair. Um, it's basically a, a continuous eyebrow around the third eye, more or less, <laughs> made of very white, white, soft, downy hair. And the Buddha emit, emitted light uh, out of that, um, from out of that tuft of hair, uh, and that light illuminated 18,000 worlds to the east, emitting none of them. Now, Master Swan Hua tells us, which I didn't know, I'm not sure where he got this, but this sounds pretty interesting. The white tuft centered between the Buddha's eyebrows is called the precious seal of the reality mark of the middle way and represents the four virtues of nirvana. Permanence. Now, this I, I added this in here. Uh, this is the character and this is the Japanese pronunciation. Joe, bliss, Raku, true self, Ga, and and we'll get back to this. He says true self, which is not he's saying he, he's kind of adding the word true in because he doesn't want to get into trouble or confuse people for referring to the buddha teaching about a self uh and purity joe the tuft has a hollow center which represents permanence the hollow part of the the exquisiteness of the hair it's very soft very downy very white represents bliss it's softness. Oh, okay. So it's the exquisiteness of it is not the softness. The softness represents true self and it's white color represents purity. Um, that's interesting. And this is a, a very pretty uh, uh, Tonka uh, painting of the Buddha teaching the Lotus Sutra uh, that I found on Etsy. I didn't actually buy it, but there's a link here to the Etsy page for this artist. Uh, I, I think this is a really, really, really nice uh, tanka. Um, anyway, now, like I said, notice how um, Venerable Master Swan Hua feels obligated to translate Ga, uh, this character, which he would pronounce as Wo, something like Wo is how it's pronounced in Mandarin Chinese, as true self. Um, when uh, Tricycle did an article background, uh, the same time that Venerable, Venerable Master Swan Hua did this uh, commentary, uh, Tricycle uh, published an article on the Kanon Sutra, and uh, they had an accompanying um, translation of it where they translated Ga as selfless, which is actually the opposite of what it means. Um, <laughs> so I guess they were trying to be very Zen about it. But um, so, like I said, if you if you study any Chinese, you'll learn that God just means me or I or me, my or mine. Uh, now, uh, Japanese people also use kanji characters, Japanese I mean Chinese characters to write, but they usually don't use uh, this form of I. Japanese actually has a lot of different um, personal pronouns, but they can use. They understand it, and when they when they see this uh, uh, ga. Uh, uh, writ, written as a pronoun, they know that it just means I. Doesn't mean true self. Doesn't mean selfless. It just means me. 
first person singular pronoun. And same thing is in is in Korean. Koreans don't usually use this form of the uh, of the first person pronoun, but they understand it and they consider it to be kind of old fashioned, uh, literary, archaic, whatever. Um, so now, in fact, all of the four virtues of Ramana can be quite problematic if they if you look at them in isolation, although self ga is the one that creates the greatest amount of consternation and actually, you know, uh, uh, motivates people to just kind of obfuscate what it actually means. <laughs> when they're translating it. Um, so impermanence, suffering, and no self are considered to be Dharma seals. Uh, any teaching, and this is basic, very basic Buddhism, any teaching that is not consistent with impermanence, suffering, and no self is by definition not consistent with the Buddha Dharma. And of course, in the Heart Sutra, the, char the, the character Joe for uh, purity shows up in the Heart Sutra where it says nothing is pure. <laughs> uh, uh, Bulgu Bujong in the Korean pronunciation, when we chant that in the Heart Sutra, we're saying there's nothing tainted and nothing pure. Um, so how do we reconcile uh, uh, Jo Rakugajo, uh, permanence, bliss, self, and purity with the more, what we're more, used to hearing in Buddhist teachings, um, impermanence, suffering, no self, and nothing is pure or impure. Um, so here's uh, uh, Zen Master Sheng Yen here. He does such a good job of explaining this, in my opinion. He does, I think he does too good of a job of it because by the time you read through this, you think, oh, it's not a problem. It, it, it is kind of an interesting problem. But anyway, this is what Sheng Yen says. Um, suffering stems from, stems from impermanence and impurity. Even joy becomes suffering because it doesn't last. Eventually we lose things we love, we get sick, we die. The four virtues of permanence, joy, self, and purity refer to nirvana wisdom and Buddha nature. These things have no beginning or end, so of course they are permanent. Nirvana does not start when a person attains Buddhahood. Nirvana has always been without beginning. The same is true for Buddha nature. It, does, it is not because you practice that Buddha nature begins. Uh, Buddha nature has always existed. The same is true for natural wisdom. These three things, that is, um, uh, the three things are Buddha nature, where was it? Uh, no beginning, no, oh yeah, nirvana, wisdom, and Buddha nature, right? These three things are truly permanent. They haven't changed from impermanence to permanence. Permanence cannot grow out of impermanence. Truly permanent things have always been permanent. Uh, I mean, okay. And, and, and that's pretty much what we assume about. And, and that's also what we say, specifically when we talk about Buddha nature, Buddha nature you can't get it, you can't get rid of it, you can't increase it, you can't decrease it. Um, at least that's what I say about Buddha nature. Okay, but he goes on. All right. True joy does not come and go. True joy is uninterrupted and permanent. Every evening I ask, he, I guess he asks his students this, has today been a good day? Some say yes, some say no, some remain silent. For the people who raise their hands, was it truly a good day? That is, the people who say, yes, I had a good day. To truly have a good day, you must have an understanding of what a good day is. You would have to experience good days all the time. All days must be equally good. If you say that today is a good day, but yesterday wasn't, then today wasn't truly good either. It's good only in comparison to the previous day. Tomorrow may be better. Does that mean that today wasn't quite as good as you thought it was? If you were to say that all your days have been good and then leave this retreat and get hit by a truck, <laughs> would you stick to your word and say, ah, today is a good day? Um, so uh, this, is, this is referring to the Raku, Raku part of the Joe Raku, uh, happiness or joy or having a good day. Uh, true joy, uh, true happiness doesn't come and go. That's what he's saying. Uh, the self that we experience in ordinary life is not the true self. It is an illusion, 
our imagination and vexations. Reflect on this. What is it that you consider yourself? There really is no such thing. It is the piecing together of various illusions and thoughts. We speak of the self as something which belongs to me, something that's mine, something I am. It is only consecutive thoughts, the previous thought generating a subsequent thought which creates an illusion of self. There is only an illusory mind which derives from vexations. Vexations in turn come from fundamental ignorance and fundamental ignorance has no beginning. That's, this is a little tricky right here because he's also saying that fundamental ignorance also <laughs> has the same qualities as, as Nirvana, but, um, but he doesn't elaborate on that really. Um, now, something that is truly pure never changes, never moves. Fundamentally, there is no such thing as purity or impurity. We make a distinction between purity and impurity because our confusion is discrimination, but there can never be true purity while there is discrimination, and discrimination comes from the mind of illusion and vexation. Okay, so the true states of permanence, joy, self, and purity refer to nirvana, but if when you enter nirvana, you, th you still have the idea of four virtues, then it is really attachment and you have not entered nirvana. These so-called four virtues are only goals that lead us toward nirvana. Upon entering nirvana, there is no discrimination left, and therefore no need to speak of true virtues of permanence, joy, self, and purity. So, you know, this is a pretty good explanation of it, but it kind of, um, uh, I think it explains it too well. Um, uh, which maybe I'll get back to. But now, so now I want to return to kind of the structure of the chant, what's going on in the first six lines. So in the first five lines are the causes and conditions. Um, and the sixth line, Joe Rakugajo, is the result. Um, uh, and <clears throat> so how is the result brought about? So the result can't be brought about just by Buddha nature. The result is brought about by our practice and um, if you go back uh, and look at uh, the first class, and actually part of the, the last class as well, uh, Hakuin really emphasizes that uh, this chant is a good way to cultivate bodhicitta, which, um, or bodhi mind, sometimes it's translated, sometimes it's called the mind of enlightenment or awakening mind or the mind of awakening. It's better just to call it bodhicitta in my in my opinion, because those are all those different translations or terms are translating the same the one one word in Sanskrit, bodhicitta. And <clears throat> uh, bodhicitta, there's actually three aspects to it, which is kind of important um, uh, to the to the way that bodhicitta is represented in the chant and the way that Hakuin uh, understood it. Um, so the aspiration bodhicitta, it means, well, here's, here's, here's what um, uh, Hakuin's uh, right-hand man, uh, Tori NJ, Tore NG, actually, I guess that's how his name is pronounced, uh, in uh, the Discourse on the Inexhaustible Lamp of the Zen School, which is basically the big, um, how-to manual of uh, Hakun style uh, Zen. Um, what is the great purpose that makes this long training possible? And so Rinzai Zen is big on long training. Um, what is the great purpose that makes this long training possible? It is the aspiration or vow to assist all beings. Okay, so, this, so and that, this is another way of defining bodhicitta, the aspiration or vow to assist all beings. And here he uses specifically the word aspiration. And our most cherished ambition must be to transmit the Dharma and to liberate beings. So here we're talking, this is aspirational, uh, to have aspirational and ambition. Uh, for this aim, from this aim comes the first dedication of the heart. And with the strength from this aim, we can break... <laughs> break our bones in the train. So in, in Rinzai style talk, this is good. Breaking your bones. That's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> Rinzai, Rinzai people are big on, on um, bone breaking. Um, very, very few uh, Rinzai uh, practitioners actually do break their bones in the course of their practice, but it does happen. Um, <clears throat> so 
aspirational bodhicitta, the aspiration to assist all beings, has to have some practical application. And um, so the Buddha found, okay, and this is this is actually a, a good little summation of uh, of Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, the Buddha found that what he taught, that is when he first attained enlightenment and taught the Avatamsaka Sutra, from the viewpoint of Satori, that is teaching purely just from the viewpoint of his uh, of his enlightenment. It was too difficult. And so he resorted to skillful means to lead people toward it. He came down. Okay. He came down from the peak of full enlightenment and entered the deer park where he first taught the four noble truths, bringing five disciples to awakening. These five were the ones who had lived with with him before his enlightenment, looking after him and practicing austerities with him. Next, the Buddha taught the six paramitas. Okay. Paramita is a Sanskrit word, which means crossing to the other shore. Um, when these six virtues of the way are actually realized in practice, then <clears throat> from this shore of, of air, the ideal far, sh far shore of Satori is reached. A Bodhisattva is one who, with this insight, delivers himself as well as others. Now, <clears throat> absolute bodhicitta is, well, so I've been referring a lot to um, uh, Hakuin and Rinzai style Zen. And so uh, with this, this part here gives kind of a, a Rinzai sort of uh, explanation of um, absolute bodhicitta, but the people who really um, are all about absolute bodhicitta really are the Soto people, you know, sitting is enlightenment, you know, I mean, it, 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 so absolute bodhicitta means all beings are already enlightened. <laughs> all beings are already Buddhas. Um, uh, turning the wheel of the Dharma is the beginning and end of the whole training. With this aspiration, one starts giving one's whole heart to the training. With one's heart in it, one does it. Depending on it, one looks for the wondrous, rousing, mysterious state behind the differentiations. That attained, the transformation of one's life has been completed. Ta-da! Um, one grasps... <laughs> again, more, more very Rinzai style talking. One grasps... Um, the fangs and claws of the Dharma cave and without let or hindrance freely walks the way of the gods, entering the course and find the real and the seeming, raising one or two genuine seedlings and transmitting the Dharma to one's heirs so that it can continue forever as brilliant light shining in the world. Now, <clears throat> uh, just uh, th one thing to pay attention to here is it says once the transformation of one's life has been completed. And then it goes on, right? <laughs> that's, that's not it. So, um, which was actually a very important uh, thing to uh, uh, Hakuin, um, uh, to continue practice, post-satory practice, he called it. Um, now, Oh, but here's more from uh, Tore Ng. Um, okay, the Sutra of the Pure Name, which is another name for the Vimalakirti Sutra, states, if you are bound yourself, you cannot untie another's bonds. So we seek the completion of wisdom for the sake of all sentient beings, and in order to attain it, we first need to see into our true nature. Kensho. And here's Kencho over here too. However, this is not to be understood as striving to become Buddha as the main purpose and then only secondarily to assist sentient beings, but rather we seek to become Buddha in order to assist all sentient beings. And so this is the, again, the, um, the essence of what uh, Akuin referred to, Bodhi mind or Bodhicitta, and many, many teachers refer to as Bodhi mind or Bodhicitta. Yet again, this should not be understood in the sense that by assisting all sentient beings, we become Buddha, but rather every step on the Buddha's way is taken for the sake of all sentient beings. Thus, followers of the Buddha's way need to cast off the sense of, oh, look at this, I need, I got to correct this, T, <laughs> I, and not to cling to any advantage of their own. In the Nirvana Sutra, so now we're back to the Nirvana Sutra again. 
is quoted as saying, the aspiring heart is not split into two. Where Were there two hearts, the other heart would make for difficulties. Though not yet believe, being delivered itself, it first strives to deliver others. So above all, I do reference the aspiring heart. The first requirement for trainees, therefore, is to let go of I and not to cling to their own advantage. And uh, so this is the, again, the um, uh, Digital Dictionary of Buddhism's uh, entry on Kensho. It's uh, time to take a short break, take a five minute break, come back and we'll continue talking about uh, Joe Rakugajo, okay, in five minutes. Sound good?
Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going back a little bit now. Um, and if anybody wants to ask a question or complain or whatever, that's, that's fine. Just unmute yourself and let me know. But um, I'm going back a little bit here. Uh, when we talk, this is the character in, okay? Um, Kanzeon, Namu Butsu, Yo Butsu U In. All right. So this this is from the line that means with Buddha I have causes, um, and uh, so the primary cause of enlightenment, or liberation from suffering, is Buddha nature. But <clears throat> Buddha nature we already have it. So there's got to be something more. <laughs> Otherwise, we're stuck. And so, um, again, according to the um, Digital Dictionary of Buddhism, uh, in or cause uh, can also refer to our practice, the practice of the Bodhisattva based upon the arousal of Bodhicitta and the period of Bodhisattva practice, which is the cause of Buddhahood. All right. Um, so, yeah, I could go back in if you go back to slide 20 and 21, uh, which is where Hakuin talks about Bodhi mind and how important it is um, to have Bodhi mind. Uh, I just encourage you to go back and take a look at that, too. Um, uh, but I, I, I do want to move on. But what he let's see. Bodhi mind is the oil of the inexhaustible lamp um, and we have to replenish it uh, or else the the lamp will not burn. Let's see. Okay. So uh, where are we now? Oh yeah. So um, uh, I was, uh, this is just, and I'm really glad that my computer has made it this far. I should, maybe I shouldn't say anything, but um, uh, this is a really nice entry. I, I, and this isn't an this is not an advertisement for the um, digital dictionary of Buddhism, but it is a great resource. Um, but it's really only it's most useful if you have a little knowledge of Chinese characters, and then you can go look for them in the digital dictionary of Buddhism. It it. At least that's what I found. Um, <clears throat> but that's the way I use it. I say, what do these characters mean? And I go look them up at the Digital Dictionary of Buddhism. Um, now, I told you that there would be more lightning, um, and there is now. Uh, so this slide uh, focuses on the very first part of Bodhicitta. Now, uh, The very first part of bodhicitta was, which is the aspiration, uh, and it's it's easy to think that simply. So, what is that? What is it? What does the bodhicitta of aspiration mean? It means wishing uh, for all beings to be free of suffering and the causes of suffering, um, wishing for it, and that's it. That's aspiration bodhicitta. Um, and that can seem pretty insignificant, uh, not particularly meaningful. What does that do? What does that do? What does that accomplish? Um, but according to Shantideva, uh, who who wrote the the, the Way of the Bodhisattva, um, <clears throat> and also according to the Dalai Lama and many other teachers, this aspiration of Bodhicitta to actually have the aspiration uh, uh, to save all beings, as we say when we recite the Four Great Vows, um, is actually quite remarkable. Not everybody has that. Everybody has Buddha nature, <laughs> um, but not everyone has the aspiration to save all beings. Uh, and it's, simp it's something that simply does not occur to many people, or possibly most people, even people who hear about it. If uh, So we might not spontaneously, on our own, uh, think of this idea of bodhicitta. Uh, think of something like sentient beings are numberless. 
I vow to save them all. Um, but if we hear it and we respond to it, then uh, that is quite a quite rare event in, in uh, samsara. Um, according to Shanti David, it's nothing less, nothing short of a miracle. It is literally something that just happens to you yourself cannot choose the first arising of bodhicitta, this first arising of the aspiration of bodhicitta. Um, like final complete enlightenment, bodhicitta cannot be brought about. But unlike Anuttara Samyaksa Bodhi, it does arise. And once arisen, it can increase. And it can also de decrease, and it can be lost, and it can be uh, recovered. I, I was referring to this uh, before. Um, all these quotes are from Shantideva. Um, Just as on a dark night, black with clouds, the sudden lightning glares, and all is clearly shown. Likewise, rarely through the Buddhist power, virtuous thoughts rise, brief and transient in the world. Just as a blind man might find a jewel amongst heaps of rubbish, so this bodhicitta has somehow arisen in me. When the bodhicitta has arisen in an instant, a wretch who is bound in the prison of the cycle of existence is called a child of the Sugatas uh, and becomes worthy of reverence in the worlds of gods and humans. Um, and so if you recite the four vows or if you chant, um, uh, the Kantian chant, uh, you are, you have aspiration bodhicitta <laughs> and you are increasing it and you are, you know, moving towards, uh, doing something about it and yeah, doing something about it is, is, is more difficult, much more difficult, uh, say so actual, actually saving all beings. Um, I think most people would agree that that's more difficult than having the aspiration. Um, now, <clears throat> uh, one of the ways of explaining uh, Joe Raku Gajo uh, eternity, bliss, self, purity, or similar uh, translations uh, is that. Uh, The, when, when the Buddha taught about impermanence, suffering, no self, and impurity, um, he was talking about samsara, <laughs> which, which makes sense because uh, it's only people who are in samsara who need uh, the teachings of the Buddha. Um, uh, but at the same time, um, the teaching of uh, eternity, uh, bliss, self, and purity is a teaching about nirvana. And so, and the Buddha's teachings was at least as much about nirvana as it is about samsara. Um, but once you start uh, going into this, then you come up against a um, another very interesting Mahayana Buddhist idea. Uh, let me let me ask for a show of hands. Who here has ever heard any Zen teacher or read in a book or uh, somewhere that uh, the equality of nirvana and samsara, or that nirvana and samsara are the same? There's a there's a good one. There's a head scratcher. Um, now, <laughs> uh. So this is from this is from a really interesting article from 1968 by a uh, Japanese um, uh, Buddhist scholar um, who, like many, actually it turns out many Japanese Buddhist scholars are uh, practicing Buddhists, and they're not just practicing Buddhists; they have their own favorite type of Buddhism that they practice and that they promote through their scholarship. Uh, and so this this article here is a good example of that. Uh, it's also a very good example of the um, of a particular theory uh, of where Mahayana Buddhism came from, uh, and it's also he talks about this uh, 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 this idea of samsara and nirvana um, 
Let's see. So, all forms of Buddhism take as their foundation going out from this world of suffering and attaining the transcendent. So, going out from samsara and going to nirvana. This is often assumed to entail a renunciation of ordinary life, an idea reinforced by the figure of Shakyamuni, whose abandonment of family and throne presents a thoroughgoing repudiation of the values of secular life. During Shakyamuni's uh, lifetime, however, there were strong bonds between the disciples who had renounced home life and the laity that remained in the secular world and in the person of the Buddha who embodied the transcendent, both his mendicant disciples and his lay followers were able to find salvation. But still, the negative aspect of Buddhism, that of transcending the mundane world, is strong, is strong in Shakyamuni's teaching, and after Shakyamuni's death, the distinction between lay and monk solidified. So if you, if you recall, I'm going to go back to um, uh, what I refer to as kind of this heavy-handed uh, definition of the four virtues of nirvana in, in the Digital Dictionary of Buddhism. It said, four positive attributes of Buddhist religious experience that are taught as an antidote to the negativity of teachings such as that of emptiness. And so that's what Ueda, this Japanese scholar, is kind of talking about that uh, uh, there there were both positive, you know, the Buddha said samsara bad, nirvana good, right? Um, and uh, which is obviously um, dualistic. And he also, um, there's a lot of teachings uh, uh, in in Buddhism, uh, praising uh, the path of monasticism over that of, of lay people. And so Ueda is saying after, you know, as long as Shakyamuni was around, these, you know, the positive and negative aspects and the, and the lay versus monastic could be, you know, kept in balance by Shakyamuni. Um, but the distinction between lay and monk solidified after Shakyamuni. So this is, a, this is, this is connected to the um, to the Kanzion chant, but it's also quite interesting because this is a pretty um, uh, clear example of one particular theory of where Mahayana Buddhism came from. Mahayana Buddhism arose as a movement to reunite the lady and the monks and nuns by overcoming the distinction between lay and monk, the world of ordinary life and the world of nirvana. Mahayana saw the earlier Buddhism as one that sought nirvana by abandoning the world of samsara and thus knew nothing of benefiting others, that is, leading the laity to enlightenment. It therefore labeled such Buddhism Hinayana, the small vehicle, while proclaiming, proclaiming itself the great vehicle. Now, um, there isn't really much, if any, uh, historical evidence that for, for this theory of um, the origin of Mahayana Buddhism, but a lot, of, a lot of people still believe it. Um, Mahayana Buddhism does not teach abandonment of samsara. It considers it an error, error to seek the transcendent apart from the secular world and is established at the point where the dualistic thinking of Hinayana is broken through. The true transcendent realm also transcends the distinction between samsara and nirvana. Okay. And it's attained not through renouncing everyday life, but through transforming it at its roots to borrow Dogen's words. Realize that samsara is none other than the life of the Buddha. And we'll, we'll actually get back to this. Um, hopefully we'll have time. I think we will. I think we should. Yeah. Make sure I know what time it is. Yeah, we got plenty of time. Um, living ordinary life is itself the life of the Buddha. And attaining this mode of existence lies the fundamental character of Mahayana. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, that samsara is not abandoned must not be understood superficially. Okay, and which is a good point, you know, um, for one does indeed go out from samsara, but while the person who simply dwells in samsara is attached to it and does not seek nirvana, the one who has abandoned samsara to dwell in nirvana is attached to nirvana. The true transcendent realm is free from all forms of attachment. Moreover, the person who has realized nirvana experiences the sameness of sentient beings in samsara and himself. That is the fact that the minds of sentient beings and his own mind are one. Um, let's see. Uh, 
Let's see, it's in here somewhere. Yeah, anyway, so it, this is a, uh, let's see, I just started when I was able to attain the transcendent while living in the mundane world. So this is just uh, emphasizing the, uh, the fact that the uh, samsara is not something that Mahayana Buddhists are trying to get out of for ourselves. And, oh yeah, okay. So this interesting quote that Ueda brought in, to borrow Dogen's words, realize that samsara is none other than the life of the Buddha. Uh, this is from the uh, Shoji chapter of the Shoba Genzo, um, which is actually, uh, let's see, quite short, two slides. This is the entire Shoji chapter of the Shoba Genzo and these two slides. Um, because in life and death. Now, it's so <clears throat> one thing that's interesting is that in, um, uh, actually, sometimes Dogen wrote in Japanese and sometimes he wrote in Chinese. Um, but when he says life and death, he's using the, this, this, this Chinese term shoji, which literally means life, death. Okay, two characters for life and death. Um, but this is also a, a common way in Chinese Buddhism of referring to samsara. Um, so actually, you know, one often hears uh, <clears throat> Uh, Zen people going on and on about this great matter of life and death. Um, they're kind of referring to samsara. <laughs> it's, it's actually what is being referred to, <laughs> this problem of samsara. Um, anyway, but they could just be talking about life and death. Um, okay, anyway, uh, we can say because in life and death, there is no Buddha. We are not deluded in life and death. The meaning was expressed by Kasan and Jozan. I don't know who they are. These are the words of the two Zen masters. They are the words of people who had got the truth, and so they were decidedly not laid down in vain. A person who wishes to get free from life and death should just illuminate this truth. If a person looks for Buddha outside of life and death, that is, like pointing a cart north and making for the south country of Etsu, or facing south and hoping to see the north star. It is to be amassing more and more causes of life and death, and to have utterly lost the way of liberation. When we understand that only life and death is nirvana, that is, samsara is nirvana, uh, there is nothing to hate as life and death, and nothing to aspire to as nirvana. Uh, then for the first time, the means exist to get free from life and death. To understand that we move from birth to death is a, is a mistake. Uh, birth is a state at one moment it already has a past and will have a future for this reason it is said in the buddha dharma that appearance is just not <laughs> appearance is just non-appearance now now this is very typical dogen um appearance is just non-appearance extinction is also a state at one moment and it too has a past and a future. This is why it is said that disappearance is just non-disappearance. In the time called life, there is nothing besides life. In the time called death, there is nothing besides death. Thus, when life comes, it is just life. And when death comes, it is just death. Do not say, confronting them, that you will serve them and do not wish for them. Uh, this life and death that is samsara is just the sacred life of Buddha. If we hate it, and want to get rid of it, that is just wanting to lose the sacred life of Buddha. If we stick with it, if we attach to life and death, this is also to lose the sacred life of Buddha. We confine ourselves to the condition of Buddha. When we are without dislike and without longing, then for the first time we enter the mind of Buddha. We do not consider it with mind and do not say it with words. But do not consider it with mind and do not say it with words. When you just let go of your own body and our own mind and throw them into the house of Buddha, they are set into action from the side of Buddha. When, then when we continue to obey this without exerting any force and without expending any mind, 
would get free from life and death and become Buddha. Who would wish to linger in mine? This is a very easy way to become Buddha. Not committing wrongs, being without attachment to life and death, showing deep compassion for all living beings, venerating those above and pitying those below, being free of the mind that dislikes the 10,000 things and free of the mind that desires them, the mind being without thought and without grief. This is called Buddha, uh, look for nothing else. And hmm, if you know where to look on the internet, <clears throat> uh, the entire Shoba Genzo, I will, I will add a, um, a link to this slide. Um, you can download all of the PDFs for the entire Shoba Genzo um, <clears throat> on the internet, or at least this particular translation, uh, Gudo Nishijima um, and Chodo Cross. Nishijima, I believe this is Brad Warner's teacher. Um, I think that's right. And this is a very nice, uh, you cannot download this on the internet. You have to purchase this if you want to get it. Um, this is a manga, three volume manga about uh, Dogen's life. Um, you can see this is, uh, oh yeah, this up here, this just means manga. <laughs> and this is uh, Dogen's name in, in Chinese characters. Anyway, so this particular part of the Kanzeon chant, is about enlightenment. <laughs> it's about nirvana uh, and attaining it. Uh, but it comes kind of in the middle of the chant, which is interesting. Uh, and it's also probably one of the reasons why uh, Hakuen liked it so much. Um, excuse me. Um, so what about after Joe Raku Gajo, and we'll talk. We're going to talk about this. There's one more class to go um, uh, in in this series. Uh, but after a Joe Raku Gajo, morning mindful kanzion, evening mind or chonen kanzion, bonen kanzion, nenen jushinki, nenen furishin. So nen means mindful or yeah or mindfulness. Morning mindful kanzion, evening mindful kanzion, mindful mindful from mind arises, mindfulness mindfulness from mind arises, mindfulness mindfulness, not separate from mind. So, this is a hard thing to talk about. Uh, and there's a um, an interesting uh, talk given by um, uh, Dan uh, Layton um, uh, from the San Francisco Zen Center, uh, and I'm going to put a link to that also in this. It's, it's like a 30-minute talk um, on um, on Joe Raku Gajo as they uh, are as they come up in the uh, Mahayana Par Mahayana Mahaparinirvana Sutra, and. Uh, Yeah, so I don't know. Are there um, uh, any uh, any questions or comments? Now, this is something that's worth, I think, you know, really looking into more. It's it's not worth trying to, uh, you know, reach some final understanding of. Uh, maybe eventually, but uh, it, it's one of those things that I think it's worth uh, thinking about and investigating. Uh, while keeping a don't know mind about it, um, and he, it, it, and you can't really get away from it because it's right there in the middle of the chant, um, <laughs> and it's the easiest part of the chant to to understand at least in terms of just translating what the what the characters uh, mean. Anyway, that that's that's uh, what I've got. And uh, 
And maybe that's what everybody else has got too. The, um, let me think. The, I kind of went through quickly uh, some of the things that I was saying about um, bodhicitta, especially this, um, oh yeah, this slide here. Uh, this is actually uh, a very important part of, of understanding this chant as a practice. Okay, because if you if you do this chant uh, with the intention that uh, Hakuin, um, oh yeah, and I can go back to that now too. I kind of gave short shrift to re revisiting what Hakuin says. Okay, so just down here, the, and and this is talking. This is all talking about the Kanzayon chant. Um, he. <laughs> Hakuin was was big on uh, hellfire and brimstone style uh, teaching. Um, he's up here. He's talking about hells, and he says, uh, uh, "For this reason, fear of hell. Basically, you should devote yourselves to assiduously to the ten phrase Kanon Sutra, repeated over and over. The most important thing that you can accomplish during your sojourn on Earth is to attain Satori, the breakthrough known as Kensho." Unless you do that, it won't matter how many good deeds you perform, because none of them will bring any merit or benefit at all. As useless as painting pictures on the water or cultivating flowers in the air, even if you practice the most rigorous austerities for 20 or 30 years and experience the incalculable joy of 18 great satories and innumerable smaller ones so long as you lack bodhi mind because you do not encounter a true teacher and learn about the practice that goes on after satori you will be unable to avoid falling into the horrendous torments of the hellish regions by bodhi mind i mean the mind that undertakes the practice that comes after satori and so <clears throat> in the chant satori is basically Joe Raku Gajo, um, which consists of proceeding forward and deepening your own enlightenment while at the same time helping those who have been left behind to achieve awakening as well. It is the great and wonderful activity of constantly teaching the Dharma, bringing joy by relieving suffering and rejoicing at the freedom and happiness thus attained, and yet through it all remaining completely unattached. This, it is said, creates the causes and conditions for a Buddha land on earth. It is the awe-inspiring activity of the Bodhisattva. So one, one problem with the way that um, uh, uh, Hakuin is, is talking here is that he's really emphasizing the importance of post-Satori practice. Um, and what do you do before Satori? <laughs> Uh, well, it's the same. Uh, it, it, he's he's kind of taking that for granted. I mean, he's not assuming that all the people. This is this is in a in um, where is this? I can never remember the um, which city this is. Takagawa. Uh, yeah, I can't remember which city this was. But this is just some. Place in China, in, in Japan, and he's just talking to the local people who showed up. Um, uh, and actually, it's not even the backstory on this is very strange. It, it's not even uh, Hakuin who's teaching, it's uh, who's, who's speaking. It is um, the uh, 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 Inari Okami, um, which is a god. Um, but one of the reasons why I felt it was necessary to bring in Shantideva is because Shantideva does talk about a lot <clears throat> what you do before Satori. <laughs> um, and he also equates what you do before Satori with, you know, this kind of lightning flash um, uh, moment um, that uh, Hakuin is, is big on on emphasizing as Satori or Kensho. Anyway, so I just wanted to get to re-emphasize um, the importance of the 
bodhicitta of aspiration, which Hakuin doesn't really break it down explicitly like that um, because he's he was all about getting people to Satori and then what you do afterwards. Um, anyway, so, all right. So now I am done. Uh, I wonder how we do it on time. Yep, okay. So we got time to uh, we'll chant Kanze on again. If there are questions or comments, anyone? Heard, I was just going to say, um, uh, share a story last night at our Zen practice. Mm -hmm. One of our chant leaders said he wasn't going to chant the Kanan Sutra because we didn't have like a, a large, large group. And he, he really always loves to hear it chanted when there are many people uh, coming together to do that. Okay. And um, so we didn't do it, but I, and I feel through this, this class, I suggested to him, hey, have you ever just chanted this by yourself? <laughs> just well, in, in well, your own solitary, sort of like your own practice. Mm -hmm. and at that point. yeah yeah it's, it's a it's a great mantra basically um it's yeah. people people would probably quibble over whether it's technically a mantra but essentially it is a wonderful mantra or a practice right but just, just a or practice, practice. Yeah. right yeah uh, you just simply by yourself and, and, it, and it becomes quite different <laughs> than doing it in the group it, it becomes uh i don't know very personal Mm -hmm. if you will. Okay. Speaking of which, let's chant it now. And then, so we'll chant um, the Kanseon chant and then we will recite the four vows and that'll be it for the class. Let's see. And my computer didn't crash. Yay. Now I gotta find. Oh, here it is. Good. Excellent. Found my copy of the four vows and find the chant. Okay. Now I'll share my screen and we'll chant.
Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming. Hi, Kurt. Thanks. So we'll have, one more, we'll have one more class on this in, in two weeks. And then after that, I think after that, we do the Great Durrani. Something to look forward to. Okay. So cool. bye, everybody.